Greetings in the name of Christ. I'm Walter Meyer III. We will be going over the Old Testament reading for proper 22, Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. First, there will be translation of the text and then some exegetical commentary. Wayomer Yahweh Elohim. And Yahweh Elohim said. Now, a little rendering would be, not good to be the man by himself. Smoothing that out, it is not good for the man to be alone. Ezeh lo, I will make for him an azer, a helper. And then we have kenegdo. Three components here, the preposition ka, then neged, and then the suffix o, third masculine singular. Literally, according to what is in front of him. That can be smoothed out with corresponding to him. Next verse. Now, Yahweh Elohim, why Yitzer? This is from the verb Yatsar, had formed. This is a while consecutive imperfect, and I'm going to render it that way in light of Genesis chapter 1. Now, Yahweh Elohim had formed from the ground every living thing of the field and every winged creature of the heavens. This tells us, by the way, that Adam was not the only creature God formed from the ground. Now, continuing on, and he brought it, understood it. Now, this is the verb bo, and this is a hifil. And he brought it to the man, to the verb ra'ah, to see what he would call it. The verb kara, to call. And everything which he called it, the man. So, let me smooth that out. And everything the man called it, the living creature, nefesh kaya, who Shamo, that was its name. Now, I translated these all as singulars. In other words, every living creature of the field and every winged creature of the heavens, you could also see those as collectives. In other words, singular in form, but plural in meaning. So all the living creatures of the field and every winged creature of the heavens and he brought them, understood, to the man. So that's a possible translation as well. Next verse. So, the man called out names. Now, perhaps a better English idiom would be, so the man gave names to all the cattle and to the winged creatures of the heavens, and so I'm translating this now here as a collective to all the winged creatures of the heavens and to all the living things of the field. That also now seen as a collective. But, this is a good example of an adversative wow, but for Adam, now literally one did not find a helper, and then this phrase that we had before, kenegdo, corresponding to him. That's an example of the Hebrew impersonal construction, which can be put in the passive. But for Adam, a helper corresponding to him was not found. All right, please raise the screen. So the text continues with the verb not fall. And this is now a hifil. Hifil imperfect, the shortened form for the hifil, also while consecutive. And Yahweh Elohim, now the hifil sense, the causative sense, caused to fall a deep sleep, tardema, al ha'adam, on the man, and he slept, the verb yashan, and he slept. And he took, so the subject there is Yahweh, the verb is lakach, 
and this is an imperfect, call imperfect, while consecutive. And he took Akath, one of his ribs, Salothal, one of his ribs, and he closed, the subject here is still Yahweh, and he closed the flesh of its place. Uh, the flesh uh, underneath it or the flesh of its place. Next verse. And Yahweh Elohim, the verb here is bana, and this is the shortened imperfect that goes with the wow consecutive. Yahweh Elohim built the selah, the rib, which he took from the man into Isha, woman. And he brought her, so this is the verb bo, uh, this is a hifil, imperfect, and you can tell it's a hifil because of the hirak here, it's also while consecutive, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, Wayomer ha'adam, zoth ha'pa'am, this now at last, so pa'am has various nuances of meaning, but in this context, the sense is this now at last, finally, Adam is saying, bone etzem from my bones and flesh from my flesh. Now a literal rendering of this next phrase, to this one it will be called woman. Again, uh, Hebrew impersonal, uh, we would say this one will be called woman because from man, ish, this one was taken. The verb lakach, we can see that as a pu'al. This one was taken. And so you see the relationship of the nouns. Isha from ish. Please raise the screen. Alkane. Therefore, a man, the verb azav, will leave his father and his mother, and he will cling to his wife, to his wife, cling onto, cling, cling, cleave to his wife, and they will be, or they will become, one flesh. You know, for one flesh, we'll simply say one flesh. And now the final verse, and the two of them, so the word here for two with the suffix, the two of them were arumim, naked or nude the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed before one another. So you recognize lo here. The verb involved at the end here is the verb bosh, to be ashamed. And this is a hith pol leil. Uh, this is a middle weak verb, the verb bosh, bait, wow, sheen. Because it, the middle letter was weak, alternative stems were developed known as the pol leil, the pol lol, and the hith pol leil. Uh, corresponding to, in the strong verb, the pael, the pual, and the hithpael. These alternative stems were developed, again, because of the weakness of the middle letter, and this involved now with the alternative stem, the doubling of the last letter of the verbal root. But it has the sense of the hithpael. So we can see here a reciprocal sense. And they were not ashamed before one another. Something like that. All right. Thus far, the translation of the text. And now a few thoughts from the standpoint of exegesis. The phrase, I will make for him a helper corresponding to him. A very important phrase, corresponding to him. And so this means that Eve was a fellow human being. It also brings out the thought she was not identical to Adam, that would have been the phrase kamohu, like him, but instead the phrase is corresponding to him. So a fellow human being who is his complement, who is his supplement, who is sufficient, adequate for him. And she is not inferior to Adam, she's not superior, she's equal to him. And the word helper in no way implies inferiority because that word azer is used most often in the Old Testament 
for God being the helper of Israel. Now also in this text and from the preceding context and what follows then in Genesis chapter 3, we can see here purposes for marriage, purposes for marriage. And this text then is fundamental for our understanding of marriage, the institution. Uh, this is very helpful for premarital counseling, marital counseling, and so forth. Seven purposes can be drawn from the text then for marriage. One would be companionship. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper corresponding to him. So to combat loneliness, to have companionship. Another purpose for marriage, of course, is propagation. Be fruitful and multiply. Another purpose is for the intimate expression of love. And the two will become one flesh. A fourth purpose, to help. The spouses help each other. They're like a team helping each other. I'll make a helper corresponding to him. We can also bring out the thought of completion. Uh, that's included in that thought corresponding to him. A sixth purpose of marriage, and this is also brought out in the rest of Scripture, is that this is an illustration of God's love for his people, the believers, and the believer's love for God. And we see that, for example, in the Song of Solomon. In New Testament language, this would be Christ the bridegroom and his bride the church and Christ's love for the church and the church's love for Christ. And then a seventh reason for marriage, and this is in place because of the fall into sin. And so this reason is to combat unchastity. And Paul brings this out very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Of course, this text at the end of Genesis chapter 2 establishes God's plan for marriage, which is heterosexuality, a man and a woman in union, and not a woman and a woman or a man and a man. Also, we can say this brings out the plan of God being monogamy. God made one woman for Adam, not several, not two or more. And then a final thought would be this. Uh, from these texts in Genesis, Genesis 2 and also Genesis chapter 3, we have brought for us this matter of headship. And God has given the headship to man. So this is not a contradiction. The sexes are equal, but in marriage, God has given the headship to the husband, to the man. That's a team, but a team has to have a head. There cannot be two heads. And Paul brings this out for us very clearly in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and also in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And so from those two passages, 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Timothy chapter 2, we can bring out four reasons why man then is head of woman. Number one, Man was created first, and then woman. Number two, woman was created for man, not man for woman. Number three, woman was created from man, not man from woman. And then number four, coming from Genesis chapter three, the woman was the one deceived and led into sin. Satan aimed his attack at the one who was a subordinate, you might say subordinate, instead of that term, the student. So Adam being made first, hearing the commands from God, was the one who was acting as teacher for Eve, and she was more the student. And so Satan aimed his attack at the student or the subordinate. But again, we can say as well that the sexes are equal. So here are a few thoughts with regard to this text. It's a rich text, very important for the life of the church and understanding this institution of marriage. And so may God bless your study of this text, your use of it in preaching and in teaching.
The Lord be with you.